Hello, I'm Pastor Brian from Charlestown Baptist Church. We invite you to come and join us as the church gathers for worship. But until then, we put our sermons on video so that we can be a ministry to you and your family wherever you are. God bless you. I'm going to start off with a few questions. We are going to be looking at John chapter 9 today. Uh, I'm cutting back on the amount of verses I try and cover. Today it's only 38, so we're getting lower and lower as we go. But I promise you we'll go through them, we'll look at them. Been reading through this for a couple of weeks and thinking about some things. Uh, led me to some questions. You've read, I'm sure you've read John 9, but it's about Jesus healing the blind beggar, the one that had been blind since birth. One had been sitting there on the side of the road just begging as people came by. But Jesus was able to stop and take care of him. But a couple of questions that I want to ask you, and I don't want you to reply outwardly, just think about this. But have you, how often do you get to the point where do you ask yourself, why, why am I here? Why am I facing what I'm facing? Why am I having to deal with the situation at hand? Why are these things coming my way? Sometimes things seem overwhelming and we wonder what God's trying to accomplish in it. Sometimes they seem so overwhelming that we sometimes think God's kind of stepped away from us. But no matter what the situation, and I think about some of these questions that this man may have asked in his own mind. as He had been blind his entire life, but he's about to encounter Jesus coming through. And we're going to read about this. We're going to start, read through verses 1 through 5. So if you have your Bible with you, open it up. John chapter 9, and please stand as we honor the reading of the word of the scripture. Beginning with verse 1, it says, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this scripture, Lord, for the things that we can learn from it. Lord, from the attitudes that we can have, from the things that we learn from the example of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray as we study through this and read through it, Lord, that you would open our minds and our hearts for what you have for us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and take a seat. A few of the questions, kind of the things I wanted to look at in these first five, five verses, kind of getting us started. And what was going on, they were walking. Jesus, if you read about Jesus, he was always on the go. He didn't hang out in a house or an apartment or an office. He was always going to and from. But one thing that you will see is that he always took the time when he would pass someone to stop and meet needs, to minister to see what was going on, to introduce himself, and maybe uh, for a lot of different reasons. I know for one, to heal, heal people. Jesus was about healing. He's still about healing. That's why he came. But one thing that is he, that is he started to go, he made the time to stop. He took the time necessary. And I think that is a challenge for us, and I think about this often because I know how busy I get, and I'm not blaming anybody for that, but that's my, my own choices. I have my schedule, I have my things I want to accomplish, I want to have the things I want to do. So I get pretty busy, and I, I thought about this this morning as I was leaving the house. I thought, I'm going to try and pay attention and notice people from even leaving my house to getting to church on a Sunday morning. Because too many times, sometimes I know i got to get, get to the office. So I'm headed this direction, and I start to notice the different people that are out, even on a Sunday morning early. Ones that are on the side of the road, or the ones that were working here, or been there. And all these people that during the week I come across their paths. And I know they're there. But I think that we have to make a conscious decision at times to recognize people, 
to stop and take the time that it takes to minister to someone, to love someone, to let them know someone actually is going to care and, and, and take some time with them. And I think that right off the bat, Jesus shows that in the very first verse, that he could have been about getting to where he knew he was going next, but he had this appointment. And not only did he know it would affect this man's life, the blind man's life, but it would affect the disciples. It would affect all the ones who would talk about it. And Jesus was good about stirring up conversation. And he led people into these discussions. But take the time necessary as you pass others. But why are we in the turmoil of life? I ask those questions. Some of us are in situations that we have no control over. We wonder what God's trying to accomplish. We wonder what he's up to, what he's doing. And I'm sure that the, the blind man, maybe many a time, God, why am I going through this? Why can I not see? Why can I not look around and uh, something that so many other people can do? Why am I unable to do something simple? Is it my fault? And if you, if you notice, that's where the disciples went right away. And I think that's kind of our human nature. Jesus started talking about, you know, and noticing him, stopping and healing him. The disciples wanted to talk about who to blame. Was it his parents? Did they sin? Did they do something to put him in that position? Is it him? Did he do something? Been blind all of his life, so he must have done it early. But they were interested in finding out who is it that we can blame. And I think we're good about that. If we can figure out who we can blame and it's not us, we, we feel like we're ahead of the game. But Jesus told him in verse 3, as we read down through there, Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the, work of God, the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who, who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. But as we talk about uh, being in this area, the, this turmoil, whose fault is it? They wanted to blame it, but I want, I want us to understand that there are times that it, our, our choices put us in the situations we're in. We like to blame other people, but sometimes it is our decisions, whether it's this uh, blatant disobedience to God or whether it's just pursuing our own desires, our own hearts, but we make choices that's going to affect us. But we, wanna, we still want to kind of blame other people for it and say, wonder what happened. But I want us to understand, too, that our decisions not only affect us, they affect those around us. It can affect our families. It can affect our friends. It can affect our children, generations. So we do have the ability to make such decisions that these type things go on. But I wanted to point out what God or what Christ said. It's not any of those reasons. The works of God must be revealed in us. So as we sit certain days and we wonder why we are where we are, why we're going through what we're going through, and who we can blame, it might be who we can give credit to. Because God puts us in situations that we know He's going to work through. We know He's going to reveal Himself and who He is, His power, His glory, and from the depths of the valley to the mountaintops. He is with us. And that's why, that's why we are where we are. So Jesus told them right then and there, it's that, that, that the, the works of God must be revealed. Second part of that, the pursuit of finding the light has a designated time. Jesus said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. Shared in the earlier service, one of the things I used to ask my dad, I'd ask my dad if I could do, go somewhere or do something, and he'd tell me he'd get back to me. And that, I, so I'd go and leave him alone, not wanting to bug him, and it'd be getting closer and closer to when I'd want to go, and I'd, so I'd decide there might be a time limit. So I'd go and ask him, and he'd tell me he'd get back to me. And what I finally figured out is what I was asking was not at the top of his priority list to really spend some time thinking about yet. 
and that he would, when, when it became important to him and I, I needed an answer, he would give it to me. Typically at the last second. Sometimes it'd be yes, sometimes it'd be no. But it was when he deemed that it was important and it was important enough for him to put that effort toward making the decision. And I think Jesus' statement here is saying, you know, there's a time, and I think every one of us live each day thinking we've got a lot of time. I sat here and told you about what's happening at the end of July and end of August. People, we may not see that. Jesus Christ could come back at any moment and take those with Him. And we might not even get to August 3rd. We are not promised tomorrow. We are promised today. We are promised this moment, this focus. So as we live our lives, we need to focus on God's timing and know what He has given us. So as we go through this setting, this intro of where they are, we've already realized that the purpose of Christ... I like this statement, verse 5. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Um, Verse 6. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and he said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Now... The process of being healed, of seeing the light, and I'm going to kind of tell you what I'm, and you'll figure out, I'm kind of putting these two together. Understanding who Christ is and being healed and not being blind anymore. Seeing the light. The man could now see the light. And he now knew who Jesus Christ was. And we all have that moment where we come to the point that we can see the light and we understand. But the process of, be, of the light being revealed, I don't know if it's just me that thinks this, but do you think that ever bothered the guy that Jesus spit and made mud and stuck it in his eye and didn't just say, you're healed, you see now? I think about little things like that, that's just me. But I think it also helps us to understand sometimes the things we go through in the process of being revealed to the light and the light being revealed to us gets a little messy. The situations in life that come our way, we battle with, we we struggle with, we have to fight our way through a lot of times. And it can get messy. Life can be that way. Whatever our situation is, But the second part of that, no matter how messy it gets, the second part of it, and it's what he told him, go to the pool, wash your eyes, and you will see. Second part of it's our our obedience. No matter what we have to go through, God calls us to be obedient. If we trust God enough to know that he's going to lead us and heal us from what we need to be, then we'll follow. I wonder what would have happened if the guy had not been obedient. It would probably never gone. He would have never, that Jesus would have never been revealed to him. So we have to remember that our, our obedience is a big part, no matter how messy it gets, that we stay on course and on path to be obedient to God the Father. Verse 8, Therefore the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is not this who, who, he who sat and begged? Some said, this is he. Others said, he's like him. He said, I am he. Therefore, they said to him, how are your eyes opened? When the light is revealed to you, you are going to be changed. Now, I'm not, as you see this conversation, some thought it might be him. Some, some saw, they saw the change that he could see. But as we talk about a change, and I shared this, part of my testimony, I was never a member of a motorcycle gang. I was never in prison. I was never on death row. I've never faced any of those struggles. When I became a Christian and the light came on for me, it was in January of 1987. I was 18 years old. I was a senior in high school. I was a good kid. 
I went to church, I sat with my parents, I listened to sermons, I had all those things. But from the, from the night that I know when the light came on for me, the light was revealed, the Holy Spirit entered in, there was a huge change in my heart. Because I looked at life different, I looked at all that I was called to and what I was supposed to be about. And even though the challenges would come of whatever it might be, I, my, my vision was different spiritually. I knew that I was living for God. I knew He had put a calling on my life, and that's what I wanted to be about. And whatever the struggles were and whatever issues came, I tried to see through that part of it, through the messiness, because I knew I had a Lord and Savior, and I knew God had a plan for me. And as I, I thought about that, on the outside, it probably wasn't a drastic change. But on the inside, you couldn't be more different. Because when Jesus Christ becomes real to you as Lord and Savior, your eternity is different. And the way you look at life. And I'll tell you this, every day we live, Satan's at it to try and get us to look at things the old way. He wants us to forget about what we know. He wants to blind us again. And he tries to beat us down with the things he can and trick us with what he can. But we have to understand there is a change. And some people are going to see it right away. Some people, it may take a while. But as we continue down, verse 11, He answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and I received sight. Then they said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. Finding the light does not always allow you to understand the change, what just happened. I don't know, I hope you pick up on the fact that they're asking a blind man to point out the man that he's never seen that just healed him. Jesus told him, put the mud in his eye and told him to go to the pool. And walked, he walked away from Jesus. So he would have not known Jesus just looking at him until he came back. But sometimes we don't know what happened. We sit there and wonder, how did I... God, I didn't see that coming. And God works that way. We can't explain how we get to where God takes us. And He uses people we may not know He's going to use. And that We're going to see this. Some of the Pharisees and some of the religious people can't even agree on what they need to be looking for. Because they have a set little God-in-a-box idea of they think they know exactly what He's going to do. Verse 13. They brought Him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. Now it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened His eyes. Then the Pharisees also asked Him again how He had received His sight. He said to them, He put clay on my eyes and I washed and I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. They said to the blind man again, What do you say about him because he opened your eyes? And he said, He is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had, not, that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him who had received his sight. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son, who you say has been born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but by what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age, ask him. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age, ask him. Three things I want to look at. Founding the light yourself doesn't mean everyone will see. When you come to know Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit comes in, you're going to be wide open to a whole new world of understanding because you're going to begin to grasp things that God allows you to grasp that you never have before. And there's going to be others around you that have no clue what you're trying to share because they're blind to it. 
They don't have that same wisdom from God or understanding from the Holy Spirit. Finding the light will cause others to doubt you. They even started saying, you're not blind. You must have faked it. You you couldn't have really been blind because this man couldn't heal you. We we believe what the Bible says, the word of the law of Moses. That's what we believe. So for this to to be Jesus Christ, we're, we're not sure about that. We don't know where he's from. And finding the light requires you to always take a stand. You have to take a stand for your faith. Scripture says it. Jesus Christ says what? If you profess me before men, profess us before God. If you deny Christ before man, he'll deny us. We have to take a stand about our faith and be willing to share with whoever we have the opportunity to share. If you know the, notice the parents, they didn't want to talk about it. Ask him. We don't want to get in the middle of this. They told us they'd kick us out of the synagogue if we even mentioned that he was Christ. So he's of age, ask him. I shared this with last hour. If I make a profession that I believe Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior and you all as a church get together and say I need to leave, I'll miss you. Because I'm not going to give up my faith in Jesus Christ for no man. Whether it's a religious body or whatever it is. Because I've lived long enough to understand who God is and how He works and what he, how He loves me. And I know He loves you the same way. And when we talk about seeing the light and finding the light, it's, it's coming to a point that you know that Jesus Christ loves you in the same way because He gave His life for you too. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in Him should not perish, but have life everlasting. I learned that probably when I was six years old. Been quoting it a lot since. Learned it in probably vacation Bible school, Sunday school class. Probably told hundreds of people, maybe thousands, I don't know. But so many times we go through that verse and throw it out there and we don't think about the meaning. We just throw it out there because we know it's a basis of being a Christian. This past week I told you that I went down to North Carolina, got to see God at work in a major way. If you ever want to see how God works in mysterious ways, go to camp with 1,100 teenagers and you'll see him do miraculous things. And you might be sitting there, I don't know what just happened, but I know it was God. But we went down there on the first day. I had an opportunity, and we went out and uh, working in a park. And our team leader told us they had the sidewalk chalk and told us to take some chalk and go find some place in the park, write down a scripture, whether it's your favorite or just one you want to share or just... But go and write it down and kind of see what happens because there were kids still running around and... So I took some chalk, I sat down there, and I wrote, For God so loved the world, John 3, 16. First thing that came to mind, it's it's what everybody knows. Before I even finished, For God so loved the world, I looked over, and there's about a six-year-old little girl in a pink dress, and she said, What's that mean? And I started asking, I said, Have you ever heard of Jesus? Do you know about God? Nope. So right off the bat, I had a chance to share the gospel. Sat there and talked to her for a little while. When we got back at the end of the day, I was telling our youth, you know, be prepared. Something that I've taken for granted for many years and thought was so simple. God can use the little things to turn a conversation. You never know where God's going to show something that you didn't expect. The next day, we went out to a different site, and it was an apartment complex. And we were going door to door. There was a playground in the middle of it. And we were knocking on doors, inviting the kids and telling them, you know, we wanted to bring them up for a few hours. We were doing different activities. But we had knocked on one door and I walked on past. And then we got a little bit down and I turned around and I noticed they pulled in. And out jumped this little redheaded girl about seven years old. And she never slowed down. She was all over the place. Well, I walked back and I told her mother, I said, this is what we're doing. We'd love to have your daughter come up with us if, she, if you'd allow her to. 
And she sat there and she said, you know, it's probably not a good idea. She said it'd probably take 30 people to watch her. I thought she was exaggerating. (laughs) I said, well, we've got 20. And she said, well, if she comes up there, will you watch her and bring her back? And I was like, yeah, no problem. I can handle this. God works in mysterious ways. We got up to the park, and that little girl was all over the place, from one end of the field to the other, and I just tried to keep up with her, and I couldn't even watch her, much less keep up with her. And I noticed in the middle of the playground, there's a little stand of a slide, and so I stood up in it, and I kind of wished I'd had binoculars so I could watch her running all over the place. Well, since she knew that I was watching her, she realized that she must be my friend too. So she saw me standing up there, came running back, Mr. Michael, Mr. Michael, can I slide? I was like, that's probably the best thing I could have hoped for. It's right here. (laughs) And I told her to come on up and I'd wait on her. And I sit down on a little stool there to wait wait for her to get up the steps. And I looked up right above the slide for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, John 3, 16. She walked by, I said, have you ever seen that verse? Do you know who Jesus Christ is? She said, sure do. I've learned about him. And so we sat and talked for a little bit there. So back-to-back days, I have the opportunity to see John 3.16 show up in places I wasn't expecting or probably shouldn't have been to begin with, but it was there. So I went back and I told our team on the bus going home, I said, you know, God's showing me that he's going to work when he wants to work and he's going to show up where he wants to show up. And if you're even prepared for something as simple as John 3.16, he'll allow you to be intentional about sharing the gospel with whoever he brings across your path. We finished, turned around, we pulled into the parking lot to get out of the bus and on the car in front of us was a bumper sticker. Guess what was on it? John 3.16. And all the kids saw it and they realized, and I said... If you are intentional about your conversations, if you, if you try and turn it, God will give you the opportunity to see what you can do as far as sharing the gospel. Verse 24, So they again called the man who was blind and said to him, Give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. They're talking about they want a, the God of Moses. They're saying Jesus is a sinner. Kind of in the note I put there is not seeing the forest for the trees. If we're religious, and sometimes we get in our little religious patterns, we're not going to see God go out and work in a way God's going to work since we didn't expect it. We have to be prepared that God's going to show up anywhere and everywhere how he wants to. He's going to use people you may not even know. He's going to bring people into your path you may not have planned for. But it's going to be an opportunity that God has ordained and provided for. Verse 25, he answered and said, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know that though I was blind, now I see. Finding the light is personal. It's your sight. It's your understanding. It's your grasp of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It's not anybody else's. And that's why it becomes so real to you. I have no problem sharing my story with people because it became real to me and is still real to me day to day. And I understand and see that God has worked many different ways through the years. Verse 26, Then they said to him again, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? They're kind of bickering a little bit here. You will have the opportunity to share your story with many people, many factions of people. Some you've known for a lifetime that God's probably ordained that relationship you're in with them to get you to that point. Some you may not have even met yet. They may be perfect strangers. But God is ordaining a meeting between you two with them. Verse 28, then they reviled him and said, you are his disciples, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we do not know where he is from. The man answered and said to them, why this is a marvelous thing, that you do not know where he is from, yet he has opened my eyes. 
Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears them. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of the one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They're arguing again. They answered and said to him, You were completely born in sin, and are you, and are you teaching us? And they cast him out. Finding the light has a cost both earthly and spiritually. God will lead you to places that you didn't expect to go. He'll put you in situations that kind of get messy. But He is with you and He is going to be there. He is shining His light that you may see and you may understand. Verse 38, Jesus heard that they had cast Him out and when He had found Him, He said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is He, Lord, that I may believe in Him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Finding the light of Jesus demands a response. Finding the light of Jesus demands your response. At some point, at some time, if you've not come to the understanding and the light's not come on, and the light has not shown himself to you, Jesus said it will take place. Even in Romans 14, 11, he, the statement is, as, so he, as, so, as sure as he lives, that every knee will bow and every tongue acknowledge before God that he is God, that Christ is Lord. So at some point, finding the light of Jesus demands a response. It might be today. Mine was in 87. Others have been years and others may be next week. Others may be today. My prayer is that if the light's not come on, that you've not been healed, not from earthly blindness, but from spiritual blindness, that in the days ahead as Jesus has shown himself to us and the Spirit comes in and God pulls you close, that you will make that decision. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this scripture, Lord, for being allowed to see what it is to be a blind man. Lord, not physically, but spiritually, because I know that's where I stood. Lord, I pray for each of us as we continue to seek the light, as we continue to seek to live for Jesus Christ and live as he lived. Lord, I pray that you open our eyes, open our hearts and our minds to everything that you have for us. You are an amazing God. And I pray that we would understand that. Lord, we thank you for pulling us through the messes that we get in. And Lord, for revealing yourself in our situations when we don't see how anything could work. Lord, be with us at this moment. Draw us close to you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. We're going to have a moment of invitation. The altar will be open if you would like to come forward and pray. If you would like someone to pray with, I'll be down here. If you'd like to remain where you are, you can pray there also. But just be praying for the opportunities and, uh, and for those around you. You know that God's going to give you an opportunity to shine a light and to be a light for someone to come to know Him. Stand together. My prayer that this sermon has been a blessing to you and that the Lord spoke to you through these words. We appreciate your participation. If we can be of ministry to you or your family, feel free to give us a call at the church office, 304-725-5917. We look forward to hearing from you. Until then, God bless you.